When I'm traveling and speaking to audiences, inevitably, somebody will come up to me after I'm done talking and they will say, hey, you remind me a lot of a guy by the name of Jeff Teagues. Have you ever met Jeff? And what I've been saying for years is I have heard this name since the late 1980s, but I've never actually got a chance to sit down and spend some time with them. What you're going to hear today is a conversation that is 35 years in the making. And man, I love this guy. I can't wait for you to get a chance to hear from my guest, Jeff Teagues, today on this episode of Unbeatable. Before we get into the conversation with Jeff on this episode, I got to give a huge shout out to the guys and gals at the Solomon Foundation they have been sponsoring these episodes. And if you want to know more about the Solomon Foundation, they are committed to helping the local church grow. They do that by giving you an excellent return while you're making an eternal impact. You want to find out more, or if this is interesting to you, just go check them out at thesolomonfoundation.org. Now here's my conversation that I've been waiting for 35 years to have with Jeff Teagues on this episode of Unbeaten. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Jeff Teagues, I have heard your name for 30 plus years and finally I'm getting a chance to meet the guy behind the name, man. Thanks for being a guest on this episode of Unbeatable. Jeff, I can't, I, I, I can't think of a single person that I feel the same way about. Like I, I have heard your name I have followed you. I know what you've been up to. Uh, I figured organically we would just find ourselves in the same room together, you know, with little effort. But here we are speaking virtually. So it, it, it's my pleasure, buddy. Good to see you. Yeah. For the people that are listening, driving right now or watching this on YouTube, I don't know that Jeff and I, and by the way, we just make this super easy on you for this episode. Both of us are named Jeff. So I don't think Jeff and I have ever had five minutes conversation at one point in our many, many years of running in the same circles. But Jeff, I'm convinced you and I have been in the same place or probably on the same target 15 times and right around each other and just never had five minutes to talk to each other. So this is cool, man. I get a chance to meet a guy that I have known about and heard about for 30 years. Same here. You know, and, and I think uh, obviously our career paths inter intertwined here and there. Yeah. And our athletic pursuits, and then obviously our, our Christian faith. You know that that's yeah, of all the do. things that I, I think that was probably in addition to our common background. That was the thing where people were like, "Hey, your your faith and the way you represent yourself, you got to meet Jeff Strucker." And uh, and and I think I think you've been doing a remarkable job for over the years. That's fascinating because since I retired from, I heard your name a lot in the army. Since I retired from the army, I've heard your name a lot more. And it's always from people in church. They're like, have you ever heard of this dude, Jeff Teagues? Because you remind me a lot of him. And I'm like, I got to talk to Jeff. So man, thank God that we're able to sit down and to catch up with each other. Um, bro, you and I have a lot of similarities in the military. Uh, you started off as an enlisted dude in the Ranger Regiment. So did I, private in yep. the Ranger Regiment. Hardest job in the Army by far. It is brutal and it is no fun for a long time. So let, let me ask you something, Jeff, because I, I, I tell people this all the time. That is where I grew up. I have wonderful parents. I had a brother and sister. I had wonderful teachers. But but I I can point to specific places at Fort Benning, Georgia, and Hunter Army Airfield where I grew up. I became a man. I made those decisions, and there and at, in my mid fifties, they're still standing strong. You feel the same? All way? right. Check this out. You and I use the exact same language. I don't only tell people this is weird. I don't only tell people I grew up in the Ranger Regiment, but I tell them the exact same words. I became a man in the Ranger Regiment. Yes. Um. I was seven, I was 18 when I joined the army and showed up to the Ranger Regiment. And it was a couple of Ranger sergeants that taught me what it looks like to be a man. Um, and I wouldn't be, I've said this many, many times, I wouldn't be the man that I am today without those formative years in the Ranger Regiment with some amazing dudes. 
that were tough as nails, but really, really good men at the same time. I, I, I agree. It was not easy and I didn't appreciate it at the time, but now when I look back on it and, you know, even very specifically, so do you, I don't know what, I don't know you went through rip, but I, I went through rip in 1987. 80, okay. So saying the, the old, the old barracks, the old world oh, war yeah, two the old barracks. World war II barracks that yes. had holes in the walls and holes in the floor. Yeah. Yep. Right up there off of cardiac hill. So remember, yeah. remember the orange clay that they would smoke you in. They, it was, it was that yes. little spot and they would pour water in it and you would just, they would just, it was where they just made guys quit. Remember that? We called it Red Square, which Red Square. was, of course, yes. the, the yes. notorious Red Square in <laughs> Moscow. But yes. for all of us, it was red Georgia clay that we would sit there and bake in for hours until 300 out of 350 guys quit. Yeah, Red Square. Yeah. I remember it like it was yesterday. Well, and 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 that I, I've been back there since, you know, and it's totally different. Um, but you know what still remains is Red Square, because I tell, I've said this before, nothing will ever grow there. The, the dreams of, of young men that, that just poison that soil. It will just be a mud pit. I was but, just but, thinking the amount of salt because of the thousands of barrels of sweat that had been poured into that square. Nothing will ever grow there for the next hundred years. Sorry well, to interrupt. I, yeah. But, but, and the dreams that were just dashed. So just like you, you know, we, we can go there. We, we can stand there on that red clay and say, this is where I became a man. This is where I made the decisions that I'm not going to quit. They're not going to break me. I want this. I'm going to serve my nation. I'm going to become a ranger. And that's it. You can't, you can't break me. And, uh, yeah, it's a tiny little piece of, piece of Georgia clay. <laughs> yeah. It is really about a hundred meters by a hundred meters square where nothing will ever grow because of all of the crushed dreams and barrels of sweat that have been poured out onto that ground. Yeah. Um, I have, I've been asked this question thousands of times. What's the toughest job in the army? And there, every job in the military has a degree of difficulty, but I tell them I've looked all the way. I looked all over the uh, military. I've seen all over the military. There's about a 12 month period where you're a private in the Ranger regiment and there is nothing in anywhere in the military that is even close to how brutal those 12 months are. And I wanted to quit. I remember thinking I made a huge mistake. <laughs> this was, this was a mistake. Um, and I, I survived by the skin of my teeth. And you know what it was, know what it felt like to be a private in the Ranger Regiment, man. Well, it, you know, it, it's, it's like the perfect storm, right? Like you're, you're a young man who's, who's still trying to find himself and figure out who he is. You're trying on these different, you know, these different, uh, uniforms, you know, the, the really hard guy, the, the kind of the quiet stoic. So there, there's all of that. And then the incredible expectations and requirements that were physical. Holy smokes. And then the intellectual, what you had to learn and know and the tables and the marksmanship. And it was, it was just, it, it was crazy overwhelming, you know, but you just, you just kept treading water and you kept marching. We had a, I remember third platoon alpha company when you came up our stairs, there was a, a mural. And it said, march or die. And that was it. Like, just keep marching. If you That's don't, a perfect like, just, summary of it. just yes. keep marching. <laughs> yes. And even if you do march till you die, keep on marching after that. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Which I don't say this to brag. It is the perfect starting point for whatever the military, whatever you want to do in the military or in life next. Because really, if you can survive those 12 months, there's nothing on the planet that is too much to handle. And like you, man, I had a rock solid faith. There were many nights where I went back to the barracks room. I lived in the barracks for four years till I was a staff sergeant. And I went back to the barracks thinking, what did I get myself into? And God, I need your help tomorrow. Cause I don't know if I got what it takes to make it through tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. A a a agreed. And you know, it's, it's easy for us to say because we, we took this route, but you know, if, uh, if I could wave a magic wand, Every, every army officer would spend time enlisted. And if you wanted to be an infantryman or go into soft, then you, you'd have to spend a little bit of time as a ranger private. Cause you, I don't know how you become, you know, I don't, I, I, the pride just can never sink in because you, you know what it took to get there. Yeah. And these, these men and women that just, they poured their heart into you. You know, I'm so grateful. Yeah. 
All right. So would you give everybody the short version of the whole, there's a much more about your career that I really want us to talk about, but can you give everybody the short version of you go from the Ranger Regiment, where do you go next? All the way up until the time you kind of round your career out as an officer in special mission units, doing amazing stuff on the battlefield. So can you give us that spectrum? Yep. Like you, I came in in 1987. I was 17 years old, straight out of high school. Uh, you know, but, but of course I went to first Ranger Battalion. You went to the easy yes, and I third went Ranger to, Battalion. Yeah, so went even, to, even I these discussions are, are a little bit skewed. Right. Um, I ended up doing five years because I, I, uh, extended to go to scuba school, which I really enjoyed, which shaped my, uh, my perspective on, yeah. on, on special forces. And then I really wanted to go to Delta selection. I, I had never heard of it before. You know, back, back then you didn't. You didn't talk about it. And there'd, there'd be those onesies or twosies of these super rangers that would just disappear, you know, and it was these terms like, oh, they, they're with the Hardy boys they're on the other side of the fence, you know, the D, all this kind of stuff. And um, it, it, was, it was my aspiration, but I had my eyes weren't corrected to the degree that they wanted them and there was no waiver. So, again, you know this story, right? You, yeah. you, do, you do your three, four, five years and, and it's like, are you going to be a lifer? I don't want to be a lifer. You know what I mean? And, and <laughs> of course it, not. You know, and then you get angry and, you know, I couldn't do what I wanted. So I, I left disappointed. You know, I, um, I extended until April of 1992 to do, to do best ranger competition and go to, uh, go to Delta selection. And Wait a second. You did best ranger in 92? A couple times. Yeah. For yeah. real. Yeah. yeah, I helped a guy or two out in 91, 92, and then started doing Best Ranger myself in 94. Yeah, I, th- I think my first one was 90 or something like that. Anyway, I get there. At, at one point, I held the I held the claim to fame of the youngest uh, youngest guy to do Best Ranger. I, I think I was in, I was one of the first E4s, E4s that did it or something like that. Wow. But, you know, it's one of those things, you know, it's, it's funny. I always wanted to win that thing. Did you end up winning it one year? Did yes. You end up 1996. You did. But yeah. that was, it took me three years to get there. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where you look back and you're like, man, that, that, that there's some unfinished business, but some things you just got to let go. Right. In our, in our fifties, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, right. I, 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 I was also interested in, in college and learning, you know, so I, I ended up going up to UNC Wilmington because of, of my, of my scuba buddy lived right. in Wilmington. And it was a lot like Savannah and it was a smaller school. And you had heard the same story. Some on of our the mates coast. Yeah. on the coast, yeah. you know, some of our mates got out and they went to these big universities and hated it. They just couldn't, they couldn't adapt. So I wanted a smaller school. And then, uh, lo and behold, my, my ability to run was division one level. I didn't know it at the time. You know I mean? I just, I just what? did my own thing. So I, uh, I ended up running at UNC Wilmington and then had aspirations to get to a, a, a bigger school, uh, Montana State. Ended up doing some training out in Montana and, and wow. transitioned out there. So I, I ran UNC Wilmington, then I transferred out to Montana State. And then there is where I, they had an ROTC program. And I felt like I was wasting some of this knowledge that these NCOs had poured into me. So I, I became like a, like the ranger training guy. I wasn't even involved with ROTC and slowly, but surely I just felt I, I had unfinished business. I had heard that the unit was accepting people with eyes and, uh, I decided to come back in. You're killing me right now. <laughs> did you run cross country at the collegiate level? I did. Yeah. Cross country and track. I, yeah. I am developing a man crush on you right now, man. I wish I would have found cross country running while I was in school. Like you, I did a degree while I was still an enlisted guy in the Ranger Regiment. Didn't have time for sports. I wish I would have found collegiate running while I was in school because I absolutely would have gone all in on it, man. I am. This is so cool to me. Well, so you finally you finish the degree and you get a chance to come back in as an officer. I, I did. So I, I and then, you know, um, as back then, if you were successful as an NCO, you could come back as a butter bar uh, yeah. as a, you know, into into the into the uh, range regiment. But by that time, when we had done that little ROTC summer camp up at Fort Lewis and I, I fell in love with Fort Lewis, you know, I hadn't been up there and that area. So I decided to come back and go to second range battalion. So that's where I served as a, as an officer again, under these legends, I was the executive officer for Chris Donahue, who's now, yeah, I mean, he's, he's probably going to be the, whatever that the top sure. guy is in the army someday. I mean, just, just remarkable. Um, and then when, as I was ranger in as a, as an officer making those, those next decisions, and I decided to, to go special forces, did some time at 10th group. And then, uh, the, you know, the wars kicked off 
And that was a remarkable experience. And then ended up going over to Delta in 05 and spent the last decade, you know, in, in and out of Delta with the other things yeah. that officers do. Yeah, you know? sure. Um, you were involved in Just Cause with First Ranger it, Battalion. Yes. Yeah. We jumped into Takumen. Um, you uh-huh. guys, were you guys over Tarios at Tarios? Tarios? Yeah. I, I air landed. So at this time I was in the reconnaissance detachment, the regiment. I was working yes. for First Ranger Battalion on the First Ranger Battalion recon team. And I air landed early, but I flew into Tarius de Kuman, picked up all of the dead bodies in body bags and picked up all of the busted Rangers after the jump in. And then like you guys, you know, just cruised around the country, killing PDF and chasing Noriega. Well, and, and, and there's a lot of discussion and actually I, I, in the book that I've written there, there are stories from that. You know, because I was, you know, that's our first taste of combat, right? Like, yeah, you know, my so that's the real firefight. That's, yeah, yeah that's your bullets are over my head, right? You know, and one of the things that that um, that I went away with was, hey, these these officers and NCOs that are telling us how good we are, the quality that we are, what their expectations are that you know that that will be met, they're not blowing smoke up our behinds. Like that was like when you look back at that, that was an incredibly complicated event and we barely had comms you know i mean it was like well, back then i think the team leader had a radio and the and the squad yeah, leader it's like right. you know, i mean i i remember in the middle of the fighting i'm like holy cow like we're doing this like no like we're we're doing this and we're winning and no one's getting hurt and you know there's still that fog of war but yeah i, I left there going wow this isn't this isn't training for training sake this is training to go to war and it works Jeff, this is weird. You are using my same analogies, my same language from my same experiences. My first firefight, I had a first Ranger Battalion legend that was now the NCOIC of the the reconnaissance detachment. He's right next to me. And he was telling me exactly what was happening and basically what, directing was me it? on the battlefield. It was Bobby Lane. Oh, of course. And Lane Jeez. was a Grenada Ranger. And yeah. he was telling me after the fight's over with Jeff, my first firefight, I'm in Grenada. I got no idea what's going on. I had an old grizzly Vietnam Ranger NCO right next to me. Another legend by the name of Don Purdy. Huge oh, shout geez. out to Bobby Lane and Don Purdy. Good and golly, he was basically man. like, Purdy told me what to do in Grenada. I'm telling you what to do in Panama. And when I got ready to go to Somalia, I pulled my boys in and I was like, guys, been in a firefight or two. I'll just tell you what somebody told me. You watch me. I'll help you. And when we get back from Somalia, you go do this to the next generation of Rangers and just pass on that combat experience from one generation to the next. And it's been working for 50, 60, 75 years now, man. Dude, those those guys are legends, you know. But then who who would have thunk in those days – that w- it would become a life of war. I mean, it, it, it became the new normal, like going in and a, in and out of combat was my day. You had your coffee <laughs> and you went into a gunfight That's right. and you yeah. came home and cleaned up, lifted some weights, got the next target. Like it, 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 and- it just, it's, it's, it's so difficult to explain to people how it, it, it becomes your new normal. Like you, and I think part of it too, like, you know, as a, as a man of faith, when you come to the acceptance that, you you may have to sacrifice your life for this and that's okay it it really loses its edge it's just do your best you know do the right thing and god will take care of the rest you know i had a very good friend who is just this weekend saying when my first combat tour i just came very strong faith i came to the conclusion i am not going to make it out of this thing alive and that was the moment everything else became easy it was all gravy after that like i know i'm not going to survive i'm not going to even freak out about it i'm just going to do my job and if i make it back home wow it's like it's like icing on the cake um so and uh, you and i did a- this for 10 years consecutive. Consi- I, I did it with the Ranger Regiment deploying with you guys over to yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan, and it never ended. Like literally got off the bird, you know, got, got changed, went home or went out on block leave and flew around the country and get a phone call on leave in Hawaii while you're standing on the beach, like drop your stuff and get back here because we're turning around and going right back. And it never stopped for 10 years, Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Well, and you and you know how we did it at the unit, right? Because everyone's so it's such they're they're mature and experienced. You know, you you'd come in during the day and you'd be doing a hit that night, and you would be you you were on you were on target just about every single day until the day you left, and then you know you're doing a target that morning and you're home with the wife that evening. I mean, it's just it's bizarre. But I, I do want to I do want to say one one thing differently though, because I never I made this. I feel like I made this deal with God, right? Where I said, I said, now I like, I, I will give you everything. You know what I mean? I, you can take pieces of my body, just keep, keep me alive so I can, I can come back and be with my boys. You know, I, I've, so I, I, I always felt, and, and, and again, we're, we may be talking weirdly to some people, but you know, you've got these communications with God, right? That aren't really, it's not words, it's not sounds, but it's just like where you're like, okay. You're going to take care of me. You're not, you're going to leave me, you're going to let me live through this. Right. And, and give you some time. You got with the boys, this, right? right? Yeah. You, you know? got this. Cause I so, don't. Yeah. So even, even in the, in the hairiest moments where I, I never felt like, you know, like I was, if I, if I would have died and gone to heaven, I'd have been like, what up, man? I thought we had a deal, you know, but here's the, but here's the thing now, Jeff, like I, I, I upheld my end of the bargain and so is he. You know, like I, you know, when I, when I got, I left, I left in 2015, it's been eight years and I have spent every, every opportunity with my sons. And it's like, you know, that contract's over. I, I gave, I gave my life to, to warfare for over a decade. Um, he's given me eight years with my boys and re, re, uh, uniting with my wife. So if I, uh, if I die tomorrow, brother, it, there is no, let no one be misunderstood. I am satisfied. <laughs> Absolutely, hundred percent agree. Yep. Uh, if I if I got one more day with my family, you know, in, after coming back from combat, I considered it a gift from God. And every day since then, literally every yeah. day since then, has been equally a gift from God. And I don't want to take one day for granted. Um, I I got out of the army. I retired from the army a couple of years before you did. But you and I spent the last ten years nonstop deployed. And then, man, like you, I have this rock solid faith, but I am 100% committed to the fight. I'm 100% committed to the cause. I want to see our nation win this war. And I spent many nights in prayer in Afghanistan and Iraq saying, God, let me and the guys and gals that I'm with fix this thing and end this fight so my children and their children don't have to come back from combat after retiring from the army. And one of the first, I, I never expected this, um, but I, I got a chance to plug in, get connected to a church, start to do some trips overseas, some mission trips. And my first mission trip overseas after leaving the army, being on untold amounts of miserable deployments where all we did is just break stuff kill people and ruin, you know, people's lives. Um, my first mission trip after I came back from combat, it was a profound experience from me. And I remember thinking, wow, the ability to take my passion, my energy, some of my experience and use it for good instead of just blowing stuff up and putting bullets in the chest of bad guys. This feels really, really good. I'm setting you up. Jeff, so that you can start talking about skull games because man, you're doing something. You were already my hero while you were serving and, and just because of your faith, but what you're doing with skull games, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away, man. So tell everybody a little bit about it. So it, it, it is, it's an extension of what we've been talking about. People, people taught us tactics. They taught us leadership. They taught us how to build teams. They taught us um, how to recognize and understand patterns. You know, I mean, we, like we talked about with these uh, over a decade of war, like you, you begin to see patterns, you get you, 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 good stuff and bad stuff and all of these types of things. And as I was looking to get uh, moving towards retirement, trying to th figure out what did God want for me next? And part of that is, is, is introspective. Who, who am I? How did God create me? What did, you know, what are these things? And, and really it's, it's a, it's a protector uh, is one of them, a defender and, and a hunter. Those were like the three things that all, that all work together. And as I began to study this crime, I realized, oh my goodness, like guys that we've worked with in special ops, counter, counter, counter insurgency uh, specialists, counter terrorism professionals, like we, we just understand how to hunt bad people and we understand how to break apart these networks. And, 
you know, the, the buy with and through instead of a host nation partner, it's, it's U.S. law enforcement. You know, so they're, they are the action arm and we are trying to provide them with the right information to be at the right place at the right time to bring freedom to a victim or to uh, arrest their predator, that trafficker. And we, we predominantly focus on the United States. Um, I think you were the same way. Good. Yeah. I took a Thank lot for God. granted. You know, like yep. I, I, I think both of us, when you retired, you look back in, in the U S and you're like, Oh, I didn't realize. I didn't realize. I so didn't many realize things how were, messed up everything was outside of the military. Right. You know, um, so we, we really fo- focus domestically and, and interestingly, one of the, the first missions, you know, like, um, humanitarian type missions that I did was going back into Iraq as a, as a singleton, <laughs> as a civilian, because, <laughs> because awesome. that was when, that was when ISIS was kidnapping all these yeah. girls and right. they were, they were turning them into sex slaves. And even, even yeah. though I wanted to focus on the United States, I had incredible access and placement. You know, I sure. could. I could call some old Kurd friends and say, here's what I need. We need some vehicles. We need some guns. We need some hand grenades. You know, we need some anti-tank stuff. Like, you know, we're, we're going to go in and, and we're going to, we're going to rescue these girls if it takes force. Um, you know, the, the, the pace plan, primary alternate contingency was just buy them out, right? Like just, just purchase right. these girls freedom. Buy the so girls it, out, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, like just, and the, at, when I came in, in 2015, 16, um, ISIS was already get, starting to get pushed, you know, out of, out of Iraq and into Syria. And they were just unloading these girls, you know, so we were, we were making these purchases. Um, but I, I was in, in these refugee camps now, you know, and while I don't, I, I, I had this intellectual thought of being in these refugee camps and it's all girls and women and, and mothers. And I'm like, man, there are no men here. Yeah. Cause we killed them all. Like we, you know what I mean? Like we, we, we killed all the bad men. And I, and I, and I intellectually, I'm like, should I feel bad about that? No, those men needed to be removed from the planet. No question about it. But it, it really, it really boggled my mind though, looking around saying, but no one's taking care of the women and children. Like this is the war started in 2003. This is now 2016. These women are living in these camps. Like what, who's taking care of these women and children? And if, if it isn't actually sex trafficking, you know, a, a, a commercial sex trade, the abuses that is happening is is oh, just ridiculous. Course. Yeah, you know. Sure. So, uh, yeah, it's all it's all part and parcel. And I still continue to go back and forth overseas again. Just you know that all that that has a timestamp on it, right? Like we're we're only going to be you know we're old men already, but you know I I, I got to figure by the time we're in our sixties, we we're going to have to leave it up to the next yeah, right. <laughs> the next generation, right? Um. So yeah, Skull Games is working all over the United States. I think I think we're going to be at we're going to we're doing a lot in Alabama. Uh, I should be out your way in because you're still you're still down near Columbus. I'm right? in Columbus, Georgia, yeah. bro. If you're ever down this way, look me up. We need so, to hang out. Chappy Randall, Anthony Randall. I'll, I'll be I'll be out your way. I, th- I think in March to to do some stuff. So we'll we'll definitely have a uh, have a part two on this. We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll break bread. Um, and that's yeah. So it, it's it's remarkable. I tell you, I I I I'm not bashful in saying this, but I hate saying this. The the number one issue we have, Jeff, is funding. Like it is, it is the hardest thing operating, taking traffickers off the street, you know, offering these women services and these children services. It's all, it's all part of the game, but man, the, the, the apathy of our country to just kind of look the other way or pretend it's not happening. That's, that's the thing that's exhausting to me more, more than anything. All right. Let's camp here for just a second because, (laughs) you know, before the movie Sound of Freedom was released. The studio reached out to me and they said, hey, Jeff, we want to send you the movie. We want you to watch it. Would you be willing to make some public statements about it? I didn't get five minutes into the movie and I was getting fired up. And every minute into the movie, I was getting more and more fired up. And what made me so angry is this is all built on supply and demand. And the demand is coming straight out of the United States. Yes. The supply, unfortunately, girls, boys, young women grabbed at gunpoint and, you know, or taken forcibly out of their homes and turned into sex slaves. Um, But when I started watching, you know, the movie, it was really, really firing me up. But the thing that made me most angry is this has been going on 
for many years and nobody seems to want to talk about it. Nobody actually, everybody knows the how bad it is, but nobody wants to address it just because of how uncomfortable the conversation is. And even the studio said, Jeff, do you know how long we have been sitting on this fully developed movie because nobody wants to touch this movie with a 10 foot pole? It's the content. It's not the movie itself. Nobody wants to touch the content with a 10 foot pole. And I was like, okay, whatever the studio needs from me, I'll do it because yeah. the world needs to see what Skull Games is doing. And there are some people listening right now, Jeff, that are in Western developed first world countries that have no concept of just how vulnerable a girl or a woman would be in a developing country without any strong men in their village to protect them. So can you take just a second and describe what it's like to be a 17 year old girl in a village where there's no strong men for protection in a developing country and everybody that you know is highly vulnerable? Yeah. So I want to make sure we're, we're tying this thread from the, the subject matter of sound of freedom as, as the foreign problem here to the United States as a domestic problem. And when you, when you use the term village, it's a, it's the perfect term, but I don't want people to think about some village in Africa or some village in South America. We're talking about the village in the, in the, in the sense of it takes a village to, to raise to, a family. It takes a village kind of to, to protect. Yeah. So I, 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 the, the movie, I haven't seen the movie yet. Um, and I really hoped that the movie was with this concept of a rising tide would lift all boats, right? Like, even though it really is focused on the, the foreign aspect and foreign dynamic of, of sex trafficking, it's that it would, it would start the, to on the supply. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that it would, but that people would translate it into the support from the United States. What I can tell you, Jeff, and I think people are going to be very disappointed to hear this, but, th but, but they could be the difference. Absolutely nothing good has come out of that movie. Oh, nothing. that's heartbreaking. N nothing. It, it, the, 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 the movement. So I, I call it anti-trafficking and counter-trafficking back when we were, you know, when we were in the military, you had anti-terrorism training and you had counter-terrorism training, you know, to, to, to everyone needs to be understand what terrorism is and how to protect themselves. Everyone needs to understand what trafficking is and protect themselves. And then there are the, the men and women that are specially selected and trained to be the counter-terrorist professional or the counter-trafficker. So anti-trafficking, counter-trafficking, you get it. It's absolutely fractured. There is, there has not been more disorganization, more, more lying and cheating and stealing from these, these organizations that could, would, should be reputable. The, the, uh, the, uh, instead of the United States even investing into the foreign problem of sex trafficking, the, the, the money is dried up. I mean, the things have come up, right? Like you've got Ukraine, you've got Israel, you've got all these different things that, that have popped up that have, you know, Afghanistan that people, that, that people are, are picking up on. But, I retired in 2015. I have never seen the anti-trafficking movement in a worse state than oh it is today. Goodness, There's less money wow. than there was 10 years ago. Um, and, and we're even more satisfied to just talk about it, you know what I mean? Or pretend we're doing something about it. So the people, I, I, you know, the, your, your audience look into these organizations that are getting it done. Look and see how they're communicating, what their measurements are and what their performance metrics are. And they, they need your support. And I don't care if it's on the restoration side for these women and boys and girls that, that need to be brought back into, you know, the healing and, and how to, how to reintegrate back into life. That's, that's offering them occupational assistance. If it's my end of it, the counter trafficking piece where we're going after these bad guys, it's, I, I think it's a spiritual thing. I mean, again, you know, we, 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 we can always go back to yes, it. So I, I think we, I think we definitely shined a light on the depravity of this crime and the depth of it. And, you know, other forces came in and just fractured it. Um, and the, and the differences in the United States is rarely, if ever is the victim kidnapped, you know, it, they're, they're lured because kidnapping is a very black and white case. Now, when it, when a young girl goes to meet somebody now, if she's of age, it's, it's a whole different game as well. So in the American version of it isn't what you saw in Sound of Freedom. It's not what you've seen and taken with Liam Neeson. There, aren't, these people aren't stealing your children. And and what I would tell you, if people want to hear this or not, they probably don't. If someone kidnaps your child, 
that child is not getting moved into the sex trafficking economy. That that child is going to be used and and dead. Like that is, you know, the the economy is built upon the resale. You want to sell this individual over and over and over. And when you open it up to the public, there's just tens and hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of more buyers that are out there. So that's where we specialize is in this underground economy that's online where these, these women, these boys, these girls are advertised for sale and they are not kidnapped, but they're, but, but they're lured and trapped. And it's very difficult to get them back into a place where they can be safe. Yeah. Jeff, you're, you're, speaking directly to my heart right now because if god didn't have me in the ministry i have always felt like i would love to use the skill set that the army and the special operations community has given me to go do something good for the vulnerable which may mean putting a bullet in the chest of some guy who's you know taken children out of a village and you know putting them up for sale online but it may be using all of the you know, network and all of the um, the 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 incredible skill set that you have of figuring out how to identify a uh, target and take down a network and provide that to law enforcement. Like I would, I felt so good after coming back from that first trip that I wanted to keep going again and again because it feels really good to be able to use some of the skills for good instead of you know just to blow stuff up you know, kill people and, and ruin people, ruin families' futures. But brother, I'll tell you, you're, you are, you are at the center of gravity in, in the potential for change. You know, when you, when you talk about the American Christian church, we have absolutely lost our way. The, the, we, we, we led the way in On this rights. one. We're entirely, we, we, si- like, you know, we, nobody yeah. talks about it at all. Yeah, the, we we were the abolitionists. We we were leading equal rights. We were leading rights for women. Like the, this is a women's rights issue. This is a women's health issue. This is an equality issue. This is this is these humans are are creatures of God. And yeah, this the, is the, the American basic Christian Church image is, of God issue. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and it's like I'm almost embarrassed because from the outside looking in, if you ask somebody. What what does an American Christian care about? They'll be like, well, uh, they lo- they love Trump, they love guns, they hate gays, and they hate abortion. And it's like, seriously, that's that's who we are. That's how that's who we've allowed ourselves to be. You know, we 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 are the hands and feet of Jesus. Like we we should be the people that absolutely change this. And this is our generation. This is this is our clarion call to be abolitionists, to be freedom fighters, put down the consumerism, put down the politics, put down the clutching of your guns. Okay. And all y'all that are getting pissed off at me, I, you know, I believe in the second amendment. I believe in all these things, but it's like nothing, nothing supersedes the protection of women and children. God got when I, I tell people this, Jeff, when, when, when you look at Genesis, right. And God finishes his day of work. On, on day one, what does he say? This is good. good. Day two, this is good. Day three, this is good. How about after he creates Eve? Man, this is he very says, good. This is very good. Okay, you can think that he was talking about the entirety of creation, but I don't think so. The 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 woman is the pinnacle. It's his masterpiece, and of course that makes sense, right? It's his masterpiece. And she's the thing that creates life. She's the thing that brings life into the world. So there is nothing on our planet more important than women and children. And, and if, if you aren't doing something to protect and defend women and children, I'm sorry. I don't understand. You want to talk about the environment? Give me a break. You want to talk about, you know, the space race? Whatever. Our women and children are absolutely getting destroyed. Emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And it's up to us. And, and as a man, if you don't pride yourself on the fact that one of your responsibilities on this planet is to protect and defend women and children, because they are the closest thing you will ever see of what is God until you actually see them, then I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. Like if you can come away from the Sermon on the Mount and not hear 
your job is to protect the innocent and help the vulnerable. If you miss that, I feel like you pretty much missed the whole thing. Yeah. Like whatever else you do next, it doesn't matter if you miss that part of it. And Jeff, I'm so inspired by what Skull Games is good. I wish every guy or gal that had the kind of special operations combat experience that you have would throw their resources literally into the sex trafficking uh industry and we would just eradicate this from the face of the earth now there's always going to be a demand but we don't have to always have a supply to meet that demand um and it it man it does my heart good to see what you're doing with the skill set to go make an impact in this arena it's it's starting to build you know like we're we're starting to get more and more of that community cuz the other facet of this is our, the, our veterans that are feeling lost. They, they, they don't understand their identity. You know, like you and I somehow went through this thing and, and it became part of us, but it didn't become us. You know, I was, I was, me. yeah, didn't define yes. me, you know, and, and maybe that's because of our Christian background in the beginning is, but the, there are men and women out there that, that they don't, they don't understand who they are of uniform. They, they're finding that lack of passion and purpose. So to, to reignite them with this passion and purpose. We're literally saving lives. We're literally, we have yeah. veterans on our staff. Definitely. Yep. And, you know, um, and then I, I'm going to, I'm going to mention one other thing and I don't, I don't want to use his last name, um, but you're going to know this person. His first name was Tyson. And uh, he, I'm sure he worked with you when you were in, in recon. So this was a pivotal point in my life because Tyson, I mean, super soldier. I mean that, I mean, again, you, you've seen some of the best. I've seen some of the best. Tyson was, he was up there, no exaggeration. And he pulled himself off the line. He pulled himself out of, out of the, you know, the, the running to be the unit commander and all of these things because his family was disintegrating. He was, it was again, that decade plus, cause the, he started in 2001. Yeah. So even it was longer, brutal. It was brutal. He, he, he pulled himself out to be with his family and raise his children. And he didn't see another avenue of employment and he joined another organization he went overseas and he, he gets killed and he was a friend of mine when we were enlisted and i took that personally jeff and, and i said Sh shame on us shame on us we we assess and recruit and train and employ the 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 greatest americans that we have and then when it's time for them to leave we're like don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out you know and, and we were trying to do better, you know, and there are, there are, there are the guys that, that that's what they want to do. They want to continue to fight. They want to go, they want to teach shooting. They want to do all the great, but we have got to build things for our veterans that they can still have that quality time at home. You know, they can still feel like they are within that identity that they recognize and understand. Uh, and that was when, when Tyson died. That, that began my journey and search for what's next and what, what is my responsibility as a leader to build so these men and women have something else worthwhile to do when they take this uniform off. Yeah, you're right. And having a purpose and some value behind what you do makes, a, especially if you know that it's having a world of good in somebody's life, man, it makes a big difference. Jeff, if I could kind of identify what I believe is the source of not just this problem, but most of the problems that you and I've been talking about today, I would say it's a crisis of manhood yeah. and masculinity. So true story. I, for three years as a senior NCO, I taught the assessment and selection program in the Ranger Regiment. After about the first month or two, I started to notice there's something very needy and very wrong with most of the guys in this program. And it occurred to me that most of them just didn't have a solid male figure in their life. Yeah. So for almost two and uh, a half, maybe close to three years, I began every class with this same speech on day one. I am not your father. 
Maybe you had a great father example in your life. Maybe you had a terrible father example in your life. I'm not your father. I will not be try to be your father. But in uh, now that you're here, it's time for you to be treated like a grown man. And for all of those of you who have never been treated, never been expected, never been asked to act like a man, I am going to become your worst nightmare if you don't start to man up in this course. So I'm about to do for you, and this is the language that I use literally, what your fathers didn't do for you. And yeah. we're going to do it in a world record time. You're going to become a man by the end of this week or else you're just not going to survive. This is my segue, but it's absolutely, I mean, every word that I'm saying, which is why your book is so desperately needed, not just in America. It's needed all over the world. Ask my friend Stefan in South Africa. He will tell you the world needs a father. And you're trying to answer the question or at least ask the question, where have all the heroes gone? Would you talk about your book, Where Have All the Heroes Gone? Why did you write it? And what were you trying to do with this book? Yeah. So the uh, what have where have all the heroes gone? And then the subline is a pilgrimage through the Bible, the battlefield and back home again. So that in, it encapsulates everything. Um, it, that title it encapsulates what the book is about, but I also won't won't hide the headline. Okay, when when you read this book, what you what you what you should come away from is that the heroes haven't gone anywhere. We're not we're not recognizing them. We're not we're you know what I mean. Our heroes throw we're a pigskin. We're looking in the wrong place yeah. for them. Yeah, our heroes sing fast. Like what? Like what? Who? Our, our heroes are right there. You know what I mean? Like you know, and we've. We, we know them, right? We walked in the ranks of heroes. And, and some of, some of my heroes, Jeff, is one of them is my wife. They're, the two of them are my boys. Like they're, they are so heroic because I know what they sacrificed, what, what I gave them and didn't give them, what I forced them to endure. And they are genuine, loving people that live the Sermon on the Mount. And that, and that is heroic. And I think if, if we did a better job of appreciating that and rewarding the quiet heroism that we have in our society, we, we, we would start to turn this corner instead of being so cynical and resentful and fearful, you know, that, like you said, that young man who made that decision that day that he was going to become a man. Tell me that's not heroic. And the, and, right. the, and the ripples of that decision of that heroic yeah. decision is For generations, generations. Yep. you know? Heck yeah. So this, the book, it, it, it again, I'll, I'll take it one by one. So we talked about where of the, where of all the heroes gone. It began as a pilgrimage, right? So I was, I was born and raised as a Lutheran and Wisconsin Lutheran, pretty, pretty stuck in the mud, Wisconsin Lutheran. Now I, 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 I don't want anyone to misunderstand my, my appreciation. I, I, I've known that God existed. I've known that Jesus is my savior before I even had brain cells that rub together. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it, this was, this has never been a question for me, but what, but because that knowing happened so young, there was a lot of things through my teens and twenties and thirties. And even today where I'm like, what, what that can't be, that doesn't make any sense. You know? And, 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 and uh, I'll, I'll circle back to some of that. So, so it was my own personal pilgrimage of of going through the Bible and, and assessing my faith and looking at Judaism and looking at Catholicism and looking at all of these different traditions and history and legends and myths and the Apocrypha and the Pseudo Epigrapha and all these things that you weren't supposed to read. You know what I mean? Or yeah, big it's long like, words <laughs> for books that you're not supposed yeah, to read. Yes. Yeah, you know, and and Lewis and Tolkien and and all these all these concepts that are out there. So I was on this pilgrimage and then it, it really, uh, climaxed when I was in Israel. So I was in Israel the first time in 2009 for a few months. And then, uh, before I retired, I had an opportunity to, to live there with my family for, for almost two years. So now I'm at these sites and, and part of the question is what's real and what's not real? What's tradition and what's fact? And if, if you have a little bit of discipline and you put the rigor against it, you can pretty much figure out very rapidly what's fact and what's fiction. I like, you know, like, 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 um, the, like, was the that the really the tree that, yeah. was that really the tree from 2000 years ago? I'm not yeah. so sure that really was the tree. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but, and again, don't get me wrong, just because it isn't the tree 
there, doesn't like, mean like take, that the tree wasn't right well, here yeah, like, 2,000 like, look years at, ago. Yeah. yeah, take take the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Like, sure. it, th- is that the rock that Jesus prayed on? I don't know. Is that the olive tree? But then olive trees live thousands of years. Thousands of years, yes. Like, it could be. Is that not cool enough? You know what I mean? Like, you know, so we, so even if it's not the place, this fact that we have venerated these locations in around 320, 340, you know, with, with, uh, with the mother of Constantine. So for, for 1800 years, we've been as a, as a, as humanity coming to this, coming to these locations and commemorating them, you know? So that was, that was my search. And, and, and I just started digging and digging and, oh, that's not real. That's not right. This is true. This isn't. And then I really, it, it began to pivot with my eyes of a soldier of, does it make sense from a soldier perspective? You know, does this make sense? For, what, what's the pattern that God is trying to show us? And again, the, the book is just, there's 27 chapters and at least every chapter 27 has, chapters. This is a thousand pages long. It's 90. Yeah, I'm it's messing, not, I know I'm messing with you, man. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a quick read, but, but every, every single, every single chapter has a story that most Christians know, you know what I mean? And yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll, sure. I'll put it in there from the Bible, but then the original title of the book was, there's always more to the story because there's, there's more that we have forgotten, you know, or that we've left aside. And, and again, the Western Christianity, we've just been lazy. So there's the story, there's more to the story. And then there's my soldier's perspective. And that came after. So I was, it was really this pilgrimage and this pursuit of my own faith and, and my own, uh, being a soldier looking for patterns and links and all that. And then I began to bring in the battlefield stuff and how betrayal and loss and triumph and all of these things that, that Jesus talks about and the Old Testament talks about how, how those stories were alive and well. And then the, the last piece, you know, the pilgrimage through the Bible, the battlefield, and then back home again. And, and I'm home and I want to share this part of my life with my family. My, I just, I just talked to my sister. I'm, I'm going to get tears in my eyes. I just talked to my sister on Saturday and she read the book and she's like, I had no idea. Yeah. And I had so no that idea. Everybody I had, knows. That book just dropped about a week and a half ago. So it is fresh, hot off the presses. And it's, and it's these stories you and I know, and it's, it's, they're real and they happened and they're part of my life. And I want my children to know, and I want my grandchildren to know, and I want people out there to know what, what we have gone through, but it's, it's just my story and people to find their own, uh, own way to relate to it. And uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty blown away on how people are like, they're relating to it. They, they get it. They understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. I've been reading the Bible regularly for more than 30 years. And yeah, like you, I look at the Bible through a warrior's lens. So I'm not just talking about those battle books of the Bible, like Kings and Chronicles, where there's just one battle after another, though that stuff gets me fired up. I read the Bible and I'm like, man, these dudes were tough. Then I went to Israel for the first time about four or five years ago. And when I stood in some of that ground and I'm standing on the hilltop and I'm like, man, I thought how tough I understood how tough these dudes are. But now that I'm standing here, I'm like, whoa, these dudes are far more tough than I gave them credit for. And it really, really, you know, challenged me personally. Yeah. Um, You know, when I read the Bible, like you been around some of the toughest guys America will ever produce. And they're incredible men and women. But man, when I read the Bible, I'm like, those dudes were tough guys and gals that went through some intense stuff. And most of us can't even grasp a fraction of it because of this comfortable in, Jeff, you know, environment that we sit in. You you are gonna love this book. And and again, because it's the eyes of a war. Let me and let me let me let me give you a, a, a little one of the chapters, okay? And this was kind of the process. And and this has been the experience has been a supernatural process. Like I, I, I would read something and it would jump out at me, or I would read something and in the back of my head would go, look into this, figure out what this means. Yeah, you know, this isn't right. You haven't been taught correctly. And and I would pray and some things, some things like God revealed to me. And I'm like, Oh, and then, and then I would study. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't think there's anything there may be in the entire book. There may be one or two things that, that somebody else hasn't said before me, right? But there, but there are dozens of things that were revealed to me 
that I hypothesized. And then I went searching for someone else that had had that same idea and then the evidence for it. So um, I'm just going to, this Christmas is coming, right? This will be uh, up yeah, before let's, Thanksgiving. Let's do it. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, the, the shepherd. So when Jesus is born, okay. Um, what were you taught about the significance of those shepherds? Yeah, they the were out in the came. field taking. Care, yeah, they were out in the field taking care of the sheep for uh, the te temple. Temple, which means most people thought or were taught those were you know the lowest uh, yes. social class, and God went to them because they're the lowest social class. Yes. So but, perfect. Yes. Dot dot dot. Go for it, man. <laughs> yeah. No. So good. And you're right. And and that and that. So that that most people and I was taught, you know, it very often and many of the things. Well, it's got it's showing that that God is here for everyone, and it was, for it was everyone, the lowly right? shepherd. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. You you nailed it. These were the temple shepherds, okay? And these temple shepherds were on the designated land that is spoken about in the Old Testament, where it is. Uh, David, I'm sure, was a temple shepherd. Again, this so part of this is prompted by when you go to Bethlehem area and you go to where's which one's the yeah. shepherd's fields, you know, like which right. one is which. Well, it has to fit uh Leviticus and Deuteronomy and the and and the requirements for the shepherd's field. So these I call them the special forces shepherds. These were special forces shepherds, okay? And they were watching for the Passover lamb. So when a lamb was, when a, 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 a you, right, a female lamb was about to give birth, they would bring that female lamb and they would bring her to the tower of the flock called Migdal Adair, that, the, mm -hmm. the manger. So the manger is another word for Migdal Adair. That was the tower where they overlooked the fields and that was where they had the fire and the warmth and they would, they would, the, the, the female sheep would have the baby and they would inspect that lamb to make sure that it was perfect. And then Jeff, they would wrap it in swaddling clothes and lie it in the manger so that it wouldn't thrash around and bruise itself. So when the angels come to these shepherds and Jesus is in Migdal Adair, the wearing manger. Swaddling clothes. And, wearing yeah, swaddling clothes. Okay. Yeah. And how did he get to the manger? Because Mary and Joseph show up in Bethlehem and there's no room in the inn, okay? It wasn't no vacancy. Mary was a pariah. She she had a bastard child that she nobody knew. Yeah, she's yeah. the woman that got pregnant without exactly. being married. Yeah. So the, the law is saying you cannot befriend this woman. She's a pariah. But the humanity of it, and it would have been relatives of Joseph, is like, okay, I don't have a room in the inn, but you can go here to the man get out of the elements yeah to mcdall adair she has birth she gives birth to jesus she wraps him in swaddling clothes the angels show up to these special forces shepherds and say hey guys what you looking for what you doing and they say we're waiting for the we're, we're keeping an eye on the flocks looking for the passover lamb and the angel says he's here and he's in the manger because again this one of the things that got me jeff was when the angels tell the, the shepherds that the that the Messiah is born, the the Passover Lamb is born, and he's in the manger. She doesn't give directions. The angel doesn't give. So it's like so either that's left out of the Bible because how many mangers do you think there were in Bethlehem? But but it wasn't. He wasn't in a manger. He was in the manger. Uh -huh. The manger is Magdaladair. They knew they knew exactly where to go to. So they drop what they're doing and they run, and there is the Passover lamb and their job is over. Yeah. And of course, when they see it wrapped in swaddling clothes, they're like, of course, makes total yep. sense. Yeah. And a, a tradition from one of those books that we're not supposed to read, right? The book of Mary was when Mary was a temple servant and the, the priest's clothes garments would uh, get used and, and worn and dirty. They would cut them up in strips and they would use those strips to wrap these Passover lambs. And the suspicion is that when Mary was a temple servant, she took some of those strips. So she, those, those swaddling clothes that she wrapped Jesus in as an infant were the priestly robes that had been used already through her service. Yeah. And it just goes, I mean, this, this is what the book's about. And it, and it's just like, this is my point, Jeff, is it's like, 
If this doesn't excite you, if this doesn't, and this isn't doctrine, I could be all wrong, but I'm telling you, I'm not. And you know why I know I'm not? Because our God is not boring. And if you think J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or whoever is the greatest writer, author of all, they, they pale in comparison. God has written this story and these characters and this interwovenness and it's the fallback and the foreshadowing. Like the, the Bible is the most exciting epic story that's ever been written. It really and is. We, yep. And we just kind of fart around with it. You yeah. know? We yawn at it when we're reading it. Yeah. <laughs> if you have 27 vignettes like that in there, I don't know why everybody listening doesn't rush out to get it. But I tell you what, um, at the end of this episode, we're going to give away a free copy oh, of cool. Jeff's book. So yeah. you don't even have to go out and buy it. Um, all you have to do is listen, stay with us to the end of the episode. And I'll tell you how you might be able to get it free. Um, but Jeff, there's a lot more I could talk to you about. Right before I let you go, I want to give you the chance to tell everybody how you're training and and uh, coaching leaders, um, yep. because you're still doing that right now too. Um, yes, and then we'll go yeah. back to where have all the heroes gone dot com right before okay. I let you go. But tell everybody yep. about how you're how you're building leaders right now. Yep. So you know all of this is intertwined, and and, and what we started off with was our history as as young soldiers. So I have a, I have a website called where of all the heroes gone.com or jeffteagues.com. You can get it either way. You can find information about my book there. And there's also a leadership course there and it, and it follows. You're going to, you're going to smile when I say this. It, it smiles. I'm smiling it already. Follows you the aren't old even it yet. leadership principles of be, know, and no, do. and do. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> of course, you know, <laughs> and again, dude, it doesn't matter how sophisticated that I could have a, a, a PhD in leadership from Harvard. I am, I will always go back to what that Ranger NCO taught me and leadership FM, whatever five dash 100, whatever it is, be, know, and do what. That's what right. do you provide to purpose, be? Purpose, direction, and motivation. I still exactly. remember it like it was yesterday. So there's a leadership course on there, and and dude, you get you're giving away a book. Let's we'll we'll give away a couple of those courses too. I'll send you a coupon awesome. code for people to get. They can they can Heck get it yeah. through uh, that course that, um, through that website. Our skullgames.io. If you go there to check out check out what we're doing, you can get to the leadership course there. There's also a protect your family course that's on there as well, and it's and it's about four or five hours talking about sex trafficking and what you can do to understand the crime and protect your family. All right. So that's an online resource. So we'll give you a couple of coupon co codes for that as well. Um, I'm yeah, glad you're just making enjoy. that uh, not just available for this audience, but I'm glad you're making that protect your family course available for everyone just to keep, make it accessible um, to everyone, you know, that shows up. Jeff, um, if there was a guy that I wish I would have spent a lot more time with 30 plus years ago in the army, it's you, man. And I'm glad we're getting the chance to catch up. So I'm going to make a carte blanche uh, statement to you, man. Anytime that I'm in your area or anytime you're in my area, let's hang out because everything that I've heard from you, I'm like, I love this guy. I feel exactly the same way that he does. Um, and I'm, I've been uh, excited or I've been fired up just to hear you throughout this broadcast. So Thank well, you, man, for being on let, this episode with me. Let it let it be the beginning. And the same thing, open invite. When we, you know, any of these Skull Games events. So uh, uh, Chaplain Anthony Randall is our, is, he's our Skull Games chaplain, right? And he comes out to these events. We'll need another one because, you know, we're, we've got survivors that have, we've taught OSINT to that are now hunters and they're working with veterans and they're working with law enforcement. We, you know, we're all sitting there trying to, trying to whittle away at this crime and bring freedom to these oppressed and, and bring justice to these predators. So open invite, and then Jeff, when, when you uh, when you get a chance, we uh, uh, man, let's let's talk about that book because I I have another one ready to go. I got another twenty five. Right, I got another twenty five yeah. stories um, Volume to, two. To, to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Um. So now, whenever I'm traveling, and a thousand people say, "Hey, have you ever heard of Jeff Teagues? You got to talk to Jeff Teagues." I can finally look him in the eyes and say, "I love that guy, and I am totally on board with everything that Jeff is doing." Man, thank you for being on this episode with me. Thank you, man. It's been way too long. Let, yeah, uh, honestly, yeah. Let, let this be the start of a friendship that's long overdue. Appreciate you, Jeff. Yes, definitely. I hope this episode fired you up like it fired me up. That guy was using my words for exact same situations that I've been in. Like, I don't know that I've met somebody who thinks like I do, talks like I do, like I've met Jeff Teeks for the first time ever on this episode of Unbeatable. I hope you've been challenged. I hope you've been inspired by what you heard today. 
So Jeff has a lot of content out there that we want to make available to you. If you want to get a copy of his brand new book, Where Have All the Heroes Gone? We're going to give away a free digital copy of that book to somebody who's part of the Unbeatable Army. But Jeff has taken it up a notch and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give away a free copy or a free training of my leadership course. I'll also give away a free training of my teaching families how to prepare themselves and protect themselves based on what he's doing with Skull Games. If you want any of that and want to be eligible to get it free, all you got to do is become part of the list that we call the Unbeatable Army. Just simply go over to unbeatablearmy.com and somebody is going to get some free training or a free course or a free copy of his book. I want to tell everybody who's tuning in, I hope you really enjoyed this episode. And if you just found our podcast, why don't you go ahead and subscribe right there on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform. If you're following us on social media, you're going to find some pretty amazing people out there like our social media fan of the week this week, Stan Hilton. Stan, you are awesome. We want you to know how awesome you are. Thank you for staying so engaged and so connected with us. Everybody say hey to Stan when you see him on social media for us, will you? Congrats, Stan. You're the fan of the week this week. And next week, we got another amazing guest for you. So why don't you come back here next week? Thanks for joining me this week. I hope you have a great week. Godspeed. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable.